And we're live. This is Roxim Live. I'm Tim Van Milligan, your host. Uh, this is where we talk about the Roxim software and how to design model rockets. Um, if this is your first time watching, we do these live at 2 p.m. Mountain Time on Friday afternoon. And then they're stored on YouTube so you can watch them later. But if you're live, you can ask questions and we'll try to get to those. Um, I am looking over here at my monitor where I have the questions that are coming in. Uh, we have Mark Gillette in, and we have Rosa from Ottawa, Mark Sell from Parker, Colorado, Michael O'Brien from Mesa, Arizona, uh, Frank N. is already putting in a question, which is good. We'll get to that in a second. And we have Jim Wilson, who is on the road in South Dakota. Um, okay, so welcome everybody. Um, where can you get Roxim if you've never used Roxim before? Uh, let me share my screen so you can see what I'm seeing on my desktop. Uh, if you go to the Apogee website, it's apogeerockets.com, um, you can go to shop, click on that, and you go to Rocket Software, and this is where you would buy it. Um, if you want to know more about the software, then you go to How To and Guides instead of the shop. Um, then come down here to Software, and you can come here to the Features. You can download a free trial right there. Um, there's video tutorials on how to use it. Um, and we also store our Roxim Live trainings, what you're watching right now here under Roxim Live Training. So all the back videos are here on this page. We are on episode number 41 today. Um, here's um, the topics that we talked about previously and what timestamp they're in in the video. So if you were wanted to know how does the co coefficient of drag change with altitude, you'd go to 23 minutes and 47 seconds in this video. Um, and if you have a specific topic you're looking for, um, on this page you can do a find. Um, just on your keyboard do com uh, Command F on the Mac or Control F on Windows and you'll see it brings up a search bar here at the top and this is only searching this particular page. So if you're interested in parachutes um, it shows two matches, and they're both here in this episode, you know, episode number four. Um, so you can learn about parachutes if you had a specific question about parachutes. So that's how you'd kind of find things in on our website. I use that all the time. That's just like one of my favorite tricks on finding things. Ooh, I made some noise. Uh, okay, so let's um, get to some questions. We have... Uh, Carlos from Marietta, Georgia. He's also joined us today. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, Frank N. writes, Hello, Mr. Van Milligan. I have a hard time comprehending the weight of materials in the database. Is it wise to actually weigh airframes first? Also, what constitutes fiberglass tubing or G10? Okay, so I'm going to answer the second question first. What constitutes fiberglass or G10? G10 is a type of fiberglass. Um, fiberglass comes in different varieties depending on what they use it for. Um, there's e-glass, which is used in the electronics industry, and then there's structural fiberglass. And then there's... And I think the structural is under the G category. So G10 is a specific type. It's a stronger type of fiberglass that has um, increased structural properties or will over normal glass. Um, so that's what G10 is. Um, so in Roxim, what you're concerned about is the density of the material. And this is where Frank probably is confused because what is the density of all the different fiberglasses? So I'm going to go here to Roxim. Um, for the database, you'll find it under 
the rocket menu up here at the top. Just scroll down here to edit database and then go over the, here to the materials tab and it will bring up a screen of all the materials in the database. Okay, so now he's looking for fiberglass. So I'm going to come here to the scroll bar and I'm going to scroll bar down until I see something with the name fiberglass in it. Um, okay, we have carbon fiber here. Okay, so we have fiberglass here. Okay, and we have G10. Three different varieties, four or five different varieties of G10. Okay, so all of these have different densities. Um, and you can see that the units are different on them also. And this is the confusing part, is which one do you want to use? And the answer that I have is I don't really know. <laughs> Um, it depends how accurate you want to be. You know, the, the closer the density is to the actual density of the material you're using, the more accurate your simulations will be. So if you took a tube and say the tube on this rocket was made out of fiberglass. So what I would do is I would weigh the fiberglass, calculate the volume, and then from the volume, calculate the density. That's a lot of work. Um, so normally what people do is they just pick one. They're all going to be like here, these two right here, number 60 and number 61. You can see the density of these. In fact, the last three of them um, are all 118.94 pounds per cubic foot. So no matter which one you choose, it's going to calculate the same weight. So why is there three different ones of the same weight? It's because people put them into the database and they don't get purged. You know, once it's in there, people forget about it. Um, so now these have different dimensions. Now this one is ounces per inch squared. So this is probably a cloth fiberglass. Um, what would you use a cloth fiberglass for in Roxim? You, you, it would be something that's made out of cloth, like a parachute or maybe a parachute protector, which is in square inches. So it, once you turn it into a body tube, now you're at pounds per cubic foot because now you need, you know, now it's by volume instead of by linear um, square feet or whatever. So that's how you, <laughs> I don't know if that answers your fr question, Frank. Um, you're, you're, you're hard time comprehending the weight of materials in the database. So everything has to be in some kind of units. And here are the density, because we need density, because what Roxim does is it uses the density and it multiplies it times the volume of the part. So. Like fins are the easiest thing to figure out the volume because it's, you know, say it's a, a square fin instead of being this um, trapezoidal shape. Say it's a square fin. So a square, the volume is length times width times the thickness. And that's volume. And then you multiply the volume times the density of the material. And that gives you the actual weight of the material or the part. So that's what Roxim is trying to do. That's why it's important that it knows the density units and, you know, you know how it's going to be used in the rocket. So, uh, Frank, go ahead and, oh, Frank says, thank you, got it. <laughs> Great. Um, Nick Verini says, how can you tell if a rocket engine is hybrid or not? Um, that is a good question. Um, so let's load a motor into this design right here. And what you're going to do is you're going to look at the name of the motor. Um, so I'm going to prepare for launch right up here at the top. Um, and then I'm going to choose an engine. And right now it's only showing engines that match the motor mount diameter or are smaller. Um, 
Another thing you can do right here is under type filter, um, you can specify what kind of motors you want to see. So you can use single use, reloadable, or hybrid. Um, so if you go to a hybrid motor, um, there are no 18 millimeters or smaller that are hybrid. Um, if I go to show all engines right here, instead of showing just the ones that fit the motor mount, I should see some other motors. And now these are all the hybrid motors. And you can see Aerotech has one right here. I'm not even sure if they still make it. Um, Contrail makes hybrid motors. Uh, I'm just scrolling through. Contrail makes a lot of hybrid motors. Um, Hypertech, which is, um, they're made by Cesaroni, I believe, or Cesaroni bought out Hypertech a long time ago. I'm not even sure if they're still making those either. And then there's Sky Ripper. So that is the way I would tell if they're hybrid or not. Um, once they're showing up in all, now all those motors are mixed into this column here and it's, it's hard to tell them apart. Um, sometimes you can look at the names. Let me go back to hybrid. Um, it's like here's this Hypertech. If you look at the name, it's got this really weird um, naming system for hybrids. So 4630 cc's is the volume of the oxidizer tank. Um, and then it's RGMFX, which off the top of my head, I don't know what that means. Um, you'd have to look it up. Um, but it's it's pretty hard to tell without the type filter what's a hybrid and what's not. Um, so that's that's the way I would tell. Um, otherwise, you'd have to you know pick a motor, um, like like let me say like hybrid motor. So Sky Ripper G sixty nine, and so if it was under all, and I found that G sixty nine. G75, G69, oops, it was under Sky Ripper. So this is sorted by alphabetical. So I need to come down to the Sky Ripper ones. Sky Ripper G69. So um, I would have to go to the Sky Ripper web page and look up a G69 to see if it was a hybrid or not. That's the long way of doing things. Uh, but if you want to be absolutely 100% sure, that's what you'd have to do. Uh, Rick Howard says, how do I override the mass of an object without also overriding the CG? Um, okay, so. We talk about overriding the mass a lot in... Uh, in this show. <laughs> so let me, uh, okay, so on our website under the um, Roxim Live database, um, you can see in episode 14 we talk about it, mass override. Um, and then down here in episode 12 we talk about it and how do you use it. Um, so I would. You might want to also watch that. I'll, I'll go over it really quickly. Um, so let's say on this rocket right here, the, the question that you ask is, is difficult to answer because the fact that you're overriding the mass of an object, it, that by default means that you're changing the CG location. You can override the mass, but if it doesn't do any good to override the mass without also checking the CG position of that object. So like here, we got a nose cone. Um, and let me, let me start a new design. So I'm gonna click on the new design button here and click, um, no, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna save this design. Um, and then I'm gonna start the design by um, going to the design components tab here. 
And I'm going to go add a nose cone over here. And it's going to choose from the database. And I'm going to choose this nose cone from the database. And I know this one right here is the Apogee PNC 56. Um, I just know that because we make the part. And I'm going to click OK. And here is the this nose cone. And Roxim in the database, it says the mass is 50.337 grams. So now, say I take this nose cone and I actually physically put it on a scale and it weighs different. Maybe I've painted it or did modify it somehow. So now the weight of the nose cone doesn't match what's in Roxim. So in that case, I need to override the mass of the nose cone. Uh, or or somehow change it and there's a there's two ways to do it when you're in the nose cone editor The first way and the most simple way is to use the mass override tab right here. So if you click on that There's a mass and a CG position and There's a little checkbox that says use the mass and the CG information below so for this particular design in this design only we're going to use our known physical weights of the nose cone. So say I weighed it and it was 60 grams. So then I would check the box here and put in 60 grams. Hit tab. Okay, so now you also need to specify a CG location. Um, because if you don't, look where that CG is of this nose cone. It's right here at the very tip. Because Roxim said you got to specify both. You got to you know the the CG and the mass override. So to find the CG, it, that's simple. That you just take it and you just balance it. So you know I'm just looking at for where it balances on my hand. Right about here, and then I would take a ruler and measure from the tip to this location right here. And let's estimate that at about eight inches. So I just type in an eight inches and hit tab, and there it is. Um, so that's the first way to put in the, the mass override. The second way, let me cancel from here. Oops, uh, I just want to go to uh, uncheck here, um, is to do it on the general tab. So say I measured this nose cone again and it's 60 grams. So how do I adjust this nose cone so it's 60 grams? And right now, it's saying the um, CG is at 7.99 inches. So I was pretty close at balancing. Um, so I would come here to the wall thickness. This is all I can I can change is, is well, I can actually change the material as well because we just talked about that a little while ago. You can change the material, something that has a higher density um, but I find it easier just to, uh, you know, start with something that's pretty close to the material and then just adjust the density so, or, or the wall thickness. So here I got a wall thickness of 0 0.045 inches. So if I want to make this heavier, I need to make the wall thickness thicker. If you make the wall thickness thicker, what that does is it increases the volume of the part. And then we multiply the volume times the density to get the overall mass. So I'm going to bump this up to 0.47 and then hit tab. And now I'm at 52 grams. So I didn't, didn't make it thick enough. So maybe I need to make it 0.55. Okay, so now I'm too thick. So now I'm at 61 grams. So now I just start backing it off. Make it 0.54. And so now I'm at 60 grams. Um, but you, the thing about doing this is now you can't control where that center of gravity is. So when you make a wall thickness thicker, you assume that it's the, the, the current wall thickness is uniform throughout the nose cone. And it's actually not. Um, this is a blow mold nose cone. The wall thickness at the tip of the nose cone is actually much thicker than it is down here at the base of the nose cone. And that's because of the way blow molded nose cones are made. What, what they, how they're made is they take, two, um, they take a tube of plastic and it's, and it's, and it's um, 
in a semi-solid state. So it's kind of like heating up plastic and it gets soft and, and uh, flexible. So you heat up this tube of plastic and you put it in a mold. So the tube comes down the mold and then you clamp it. Um, so why is it thicker at the top than the bottom? Well, it's because of the weight of that of the bottom part of the plastic is heavy and it's pulling and it's stretching the plastic. Just the weight of it is stretching it. Um, so the, the stuff at the bottom is a little bit thinner than the stuff at the top. And then they close the mold like this. So you got a tube inside of a mold and then from the bottom or wherever, you can tell usually just by looking at the, at the part, there's always going to be a little hole and into that little hole they shoot a high pressure air and then just blow it up and it blows it up in the mold and you get the nice shape. Um, so that's how a blow mold is made. And why they're thicker at the front rather than the back. Um, so by doing the wall thickness trick you don't have as much control over where that center of gravity is. So if, if the location of the center of gravity is absolutely critical use the mass override. Um, but if you have a like a balsa nose cone, I mean that's going to be a constant um, uniform material throughout the nose cone. So you, um, you know on that way I would just, if it's not matching it's because your density is is not quite right. So if your density is not quite right then you have to go into the materials editor which I just showed you at the very beginning and tweak the density until you get the right component mass. But that's hard. That's hard and, and it's once you change the density in the database it affects all your rock sim designs that use that material. So if you change balsa wood in the database it's going to affect balsa wood for you know like a Big Bertha and an Elsa's Alpha for everything. So you got to be really careful on what you do and maybe that's why there's multiple similar materials in the database that are just slightly tweaked from from one to the other. Uh, but they do need specific names. Um, so Rick, uh, let me know if that answered your question. Oh, and he says, thanks for the explanation. <laughs> all that yakking of did must have worked. Uh, hey, that clears all the questions. <laughs> if you got more, Now's the time. I'm going to take a sip of water here. We have Chris Schaefer from Ohio. Thank you, Rick, Chris, for showing up. Uh, no more questions. Um, I had, at the, the be very, very beginning, I had, uh, I had a design open. It was the uh, somebody that somebody sent me. Let's see if I still have it. It was in my email, and I don't want to dig through my email to try to find it. Um, he had a he had a rocket that he was trying to launch, and every time he launched it, um, he couldn't get any altitude from it. And and I figured it out like like that. Uh, and the way to figure it out is to look at the flight profile. Uh, well, here it is. Okay, so he, he, here's what he did. Okay, so he had this rocket. This is the file he sent me. And under flight simulations, if you look here, um, this rocket went a maximum of 0 0.01 feet. And he was doing this over and over and over again with different designs every time. And he was frustrated. And um, and then, like always, the, the first thing people say when they get the same results over and over and it's not what they expected, they say, there's something wrong with Roxim. It's not working right. Roxim 9 didn't do this, but Roxim 10 does. And over and over again, we try to tell people there's nothing wrong with Roxim 10. It's just the way you have it set up. Um, but here's the problem of just looking at the simulation summary. Um, you can't tell what is wrong by looking at this. Um, in fact, it's 
You can double click on, on the simulation summary and it will bring up the detailed flight report. Um, and then even looking at this data, it can be hard to figure out what's going on. And that's why I always tell people the first thing you should do if you're trying to troubleshoot RockSim is to look at it in the flight profile. So I'm going to take this simulation and this is what I actually do is you right click on the simulation and you choose edit. When you choose edit, it loads everything the way it was when the simulation was actually run. So not only does it load the motor, but it also loads um, all the flight parameters like the wind condition and the altitude and all that information. Um, and then from here, you just click on flight profile and then I can see what is going on with this simulation. Okay, so it's giving me the spinny ball of death. <laughs> Why does it do that? That's not good. I have to force quit it. See, it says it's not responding. Uh, let's force quit. Now open it up again. I want to show you this. Uh, cancel all. Escape. Okay, so here's Roxanne. I changed my screen so you can see it, so I'm not covering it up. Um, okay, so you can see it. Let's open that design again. File open recent. This one, I couldn't find it. Uh, here it is right there. It was in my mail library. Um, okay, so let's see if I can crash it again. Oh, this is not the same one. Um, can't find a D21 because the uh, this was an old file. So I'm going to choose an engine. It doesn't matter which one I choose. D16, 6, 8, uh, flight profile. So I'm just checking here to make sure the flight profile is working. Loading sprites. Okay, so it worked. Um, okay, this is not the simulation. Um, because you can see on these simulations, there's altitudes. And I say, okay, well, this is not what you had told me in your email. So then I asked him to send it again. Um, let's see if it's this one. Uh, I crashed it again. <laughs> Sometimes uh, this is the bug that we're trying to figure out because this is inconsistent. It doesn't crash all the time. It just crashes when I'm trying to run a Roxium Live. <laughs> Uh, file open recent. Let's try this one. Okay, this is the one. Um, let me run a simulation first. So first, I want to choose an engine. So I'm just choosing this to be six four and flight profile. Just want to make sure everything's working. Loading my sprite files. Okay, so on this particular flight, you can see the rock the rocket is flying just fine. You know, it, it takes off, goes up, comes down, doesn't go very high. Uh, you know, well, just over 100 feet and then falls back down to the ground. Okay, so when I do that, it tells me that there's nothing wrong with the rock, rock sim design file. There's something wrong with his simulation. So I do edit on that simulation. It loads the motor and then I click flight profile. And I hope, hopefully <laughs> it's, gonna, it's gonna show me the flight profile. Nope, it's gonna see, there's something wrong with that simulation. Um, yeah, it, it just it just hung up and crashed again. I can show you another way. Let me quit that again. Let's see, it's Roxim is not responding. Force quit. There's something wrong with that simulation, and that's why it's 
it's having problems. Uh, let's see, Nick Ferranini says, last week you showed us how to send a nose cone design to a 3D printer using export template. I'm using an, a PC and don't see that choice on my screen. Am I missing something? And the answer is yes. Um, there is a secret code. No, there's a, there's a, a preference that you have to set, Nick. Um, so let me open, let me open that design one last time. I'm not going to launch the simulation, but I'm going to show you how I figured it out. Um, so under the flight simulations, um, I double clicked here and then I started looking through his data and I'll leave this data up here for a second and see if you can see what the problem was with that simulation on why it didn't go very high. Look at the setup of this rocket and tell me why it didn't go very high. Joe Noble says, did I see an altitude of 500,000 feet? Um, probably not. What you probably see is a big number where the decimal point is, and then there's a lot of zeros afterwards. Um, that's something that always bothers me is, you know, you, that much precision is just like impossible, you know, so we shouldn't be displaying it with that much dis precision. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you what the problem was. Launch guide angle, 98.251 degrees. Um, so launch angle is always measured from vertical. So he has a 98.25 degree launch angle like this. So he's launching downwards. Um, you would see that right away if you looked at the flight profile because in the flight profile, instead of the rocket being pointed up, it's going to be pointed that way. Um, so always, when you're troubleshooting, always start with the flight profile. Just look at it. Is, just say, is something wrong with this? Is this, you know, oh, I got my rocket aimed at the wrong direction. That would save me a lot of trouble, you know, and when I have to point it out to him, then he's embarrassed, and, and it's not my... Yeah, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I'm trying to save myself a lot of hassle. Um, so, <laughs> okay. So next question is, how do you get, how do you print a 3D nose cone? So uh, let me open up a different design just to make sure that we're not playing with this design that keeps crashing on me. So I'm going to open up the flamethrower here. Okay, so here's the flamethrower rocket. Um, and we want to 3D print this nose cone. So what you can do is click on the nose cone and it highlights it. Um, and if you come to the design components here, it should be highlighted up here. So if I clicked on a fin down here, it should highlight it in the parts tree here. So if I want to print the nose cone, I click here and I can find that nose cone really fast. And then I, if I double click on it to open it up, you get the editor window. And what we want is this button down here that says export template. And this is the button that Nick is not seeing in his rock sim. And if you're not seeing it, that immediately tells me that your preferences aren't set to see that button. So I'm going to cancel out of here and I'll show you where you find it. Okay, so if you go to the preferences and on Mac, it's under the rock sim menu under preferences here and I think under windows it's either under edit I think it's under edit um, so then you'd, you'd see preferences here and if it's not there it's under help um, but you got to open the preferences and what you do is here in preferences under the miscellaneous tab click on that and you'll see a button checkbox here that says allow template exports 
And so if it's not checked, so I unchecked it here, click OK, and if I go to my nose cone and edit it now, you can see before we had export template button right here, and it's not showing up. So that's because I unchecked it. So to see it, you need to ch un check it. So it says to allow template exports. So again, it's under miscellaneous in the preferences, and then say allow template exports. Click OK. And then when you go to the nose cone or whatever, it crashed again. <laughs> whatever part you wanted, it will be, um, it will show that export templates. We're going to cancel this. I always have to adjust my screen every time. So let me see if I still have it checked. Allow it, say OK. Open a design. Let's go to Roxham Designs. It doesn't matter which design. Click Open. Find the nose cone. Open it up. So there's export templates. And when you click on export templates, um, you can save it here as an STL file. And this is three dimensions. So if I click that, uh, click Save. Before I save it, I want to know where it's saving it to. Right now it's saving it into this folder. I just want to put it on the desktop. So now it's on the desktop and I click Save. And here's where you specify the resolution. And I'm going to say very high resolution. And this is a recommended what we always tell people. Just choose very high resolution. Because in your slicer, you can change the resolution. You can, you can always reduce it. But um, once you export it as a low resolution, you can't make it high resolution in your, sl your slicer because the data is just not there. Um, and then click OK. And it exported it, and it put it onto the desktop right up here, and then click OK. So if I open up my uh, desktop, and I go to the desktop here, and here it is, my flamethrower nose cone. Um, you can't see it in 3D, but on Mac, Mac has this nice little feature where I can preview things just by clicking this button here. So if I click that, it's uh, rendering that nose cone, and you can see what the nose cone will look like when you um, bring it into your slicer and then you start printing it out. So that is how um, you get that. You just, I would just leave it as export template, I mean, because that's what you'll probably always want to do. Uh, Fat Bank says, on a PC, preferences is under edit. Good. <laughs> um, Chris Schaefer says, does Roxim support motor files from Open Motor? That is a good question. I have no idea what Open Motor is. Uh, so I'm going to Google and looking up Open Motor Rocket Files. See what pops up. Um, Updating open files, resources. Um, I have no idea. I, I know what open rocket is, but I don't know what open motor is. And it looks like there's a. Uh, see, those are for open rocket. There's open motor here under GitHub, and this is a service that gives you the actual code. So you have to be a programmer to understand this, and I'm not a programmer. Um, so let me see here, Let's see if there's anything about what it exports out. So it looks like a really cool f uh, software. Um, the question is, what format does it export the files? 
Motor files have the extension .ric to differentiate them, but internally they are YAML and can be edited in a text editor if desired. Um, so I have no idea, Chris, because uh, I have never seen that format before. YAML. Um, yeah, all this is like Greek to me because I'm not a programmer, so I am clueless on that. If you can some, what Roxim opens are two different formats. The first one is RASP format. Um, that in, you can tell a motor if it's in RASP format, the extension on it is .rse. Um, and then the other one is, no, RSE is Roxim engine. Um, the RAS format is .eng, so if it's either one of those two formats, it can open it. So if your open motor program has a way to convert to .eng or to .rse, then the answer is yes, It'll, it should open it just fine. Um, but we do not have a conversion to open motor. It looks like a pretty cool program because for people that are designing their own motors, that looks good. I might have the wrong name. Um, yeah, so Chris, I think I found it. Um, so that was that. Um, Karen Ma says, a rocket, especially the coefficient of drag after the air brake is deployed. I don't know how to find out the coefficient of drag to use the parachute to simulate air brakes. Suggestion? <laughs> I knew this I knew this question was coming after last week. Is how do you find the coefficient of drag of your rocket with the air brakes deployed? So, Karen, you're gonna have to do some experiments. And what you're gonna have to do is to launch your rocket with the air brakes already deployed so you know spread out or whatever okay so it's not going to go very high it's going to kind of be like you know a flying saucer when they take off they go <laughs> uh, but what you need is data from that so mm. how would you collect that data and then how do you use it so let me show you, because we have a newsletter article on finding the coefficient of drag of a rocket as it takes off. So to find that newsletter, go to How To and Guides on our website, and then go down here to Peak of Flight Newsletter, click on that, then go to All Newsletters right here. Okay, so this is an index of all currently 558 newsletters that we've produced since 2000. So we've been doing this for over 20 years. Uh, there is an article in here on finding the coefficient of drag. So remember, um, this is a little test. How do you find a specific topic on a specific web page on the Apogee website? What's my little trick? My little trick is Control F on Windows, Command F on an Apple. So I'm going to do a Command F, and then I get a search bar up here. And I'm going to type in coefficient. Okay, and coefficient is used four times on this page. So the first one is in 489, derivation of apparent coefficient drag, and that's not it. Okay, here it is. Um, issue number 303, how to determine the drag coefficient of your rockets. So I'm gonna click on that, and it will bring up our Peak of Flight newsletter. So this is the Peak of Flight newsletter that we produce every two weeks. Um, if you're not a subscriber, <laughs> I, should, I should plug our newsletter right now. If you're not a subscriber, um, I'm gonna open up a new tab here to the Apogee website. Um, you'll see uh, there's there's this banner bar here on the top and you just scroll here until you say sign up for our 
free newsletter and you also get a book of 25 free rocket plans. So then you come here on this page and this is where you enter your name and your email. And then you're on our list and then we send you notifications when we produce newsletters like this one right here. Um, so here is a step-by-step -step process of determining drag of your model rocket. And there's a couple ways to do it, but the way that you have to use for your experiment, Karen, is you have to get a payload that has an accelerometer in it. You need to measure accelerometer data versus time. So it's just not peak acceleration. Um, a peak acceleration accelerometer would be something like the Jolly Logic Altimeter 2. Jolly Logic used to make the Altimeter 3. That was my favorite altimeter um, because that one also recorded acceleration over the time that the rocket was in the air. Jolly Logic is currently back ordered on that altimeter three, and they've been back ordered for over two years. So don't expect to find a Jolly Logic altimeter three. But you, would, but we do have other altimeters that do record L acceleration data. Um, the Altus Metrum Telemetrum records accelerometer data and I think there's maybe one or two other ones and if you go on the Apogee website so here on the Apogee website um, I would go to shop then come down here to electronics and payloads right here click on that and you will see um, different altimeters. So here's all the altimeters. Here's the dual deployment altimeters. And I'm pretty sure that it's only the dual deployment. Well, only currently the altimeter three wasn't a dual deployment. It, so it would have been under this one. But the Altus Metrum Telemetrum is under this one right here. So you click on that. Um, Okay, so here's the telemetrum. Um, we'll get more pretty soon. Telemetrum is made by um, Telem Altus Metrum, who's actually located here in Colorado Springs. So they're just like a stone's throw away from, from us. Um, the Telemega also records acceleration. The Easy Mega records acceleration. Uh, the RRC3, I'm not sure about this one. Let me check on this one. Does this one record acceleration? Um, the records, records peak and average acceleration. Where it says derivable, that means no. Don't use it. Don't use it. So basically the, the products you have to use are one of the three Altus Metrum accelerometer payloads. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to measure um, acceleration and then you're going to backtrack out the coefficient of drag. And this article explains it step-by-step -step fashion how to back out that coefficient of drag. Um, and you can actually do it. See, originally, when I wrote this article, I was doing terminal velocity, velocity as the rocket's coming down. So you basically launch the rocket in the air, it arcs over the top, and it starts coming down, and eventually it's going to reach terminal velocity where it's not picking up speed anymore. And at that point, drag and the force of gravity match. And from that, you can get out the coefficient of drag because drag because um, you can yeah, you can get it out from Roxim. Um, but what I found is you can also get it with the rocket going up, um, measuring from burnout to apogee, you know, because the rocket's going fast, and once it stops, the only thing acting on it is drag. And that's what you're measuring when you're measuring you know the acceleration. Um, so you you can, it's, a, it's an involved process. I'm not going to kid you, but it's the only way to do it.
So if you want to know the coefficient of drag with the drag brakes deployed, this is the only method that I know of to figure it out. Or the other one is you could throw it into a wind tunnel. Um, but how many people have a wind tunnel? So if maybe if you if there's a university or college near you, Karen, that has an, a wind tunnel, and they'll put, allow you to put something into their wind tunnel and measure the coefficient of drag. That's another way to do it. But colleges are very leery of letting you use their wind tunnel because um, I tried to use a wind tunnel at a local university once and they said no. And they said the reason why is if, if something falls off your rocket, it's gonna get sucked in through the fans that blow the air around and round in the wind tunnel. And it's kind of like a bird hitting the propeller on an airplane. You, you know, you could da damage your wind tunnel. So they're, you, you have to be really sweet talking to them to get permission to use a wind tunnel. Um, you know, it's, but it's for educational purposes, so you might be able to do it. But if you can't, then you got to launch the rocket and record the acceleration. And it's not easy, but it can be done. Um, Nick Vernon, he says, Roxim Pro is $30 per month plus tax. And that's correct. Um, Roxim Pro is like Roxim, but it's uh, three degrees of freedom software where Roxim is only, or Roxim Pro is six degrees of freedom where Roxim is just three. Can Roxim and Roxim Pro key be registered on the same computer as Fat Bank? And the answer is yes. Um, here I have Roxim, and down here is Roxim Pro. And I often, and if you watch this, this you know, our uh, Roxim Live, you know I often run one and the other at the same time. Um, so now I got them both running at the same time on my computer. This front one here is Roxim Pro, and you can see it says Roxim Pro on the top. And in the back one, it just says Roxim. So you can, you can run them both at the same time, registered on the same machine. So that's easier. Joe Noble says, does Roxim use actual force or drag force? Um... Uh, Drag force. <laughs> um, so okay, so how do how do I how can I prove that? Um, so I'm going to take this rocket right here and I'm going to run a simulation. Um, choose an engine. Let me choose an Estes D12. D12. Let's call it a seven. Load it all. So I got two D12-7s loaded under simulation controls. Um, that one, leave that one alone, leave that alone. Starting state, I'm launching straight up. And then under launch conditions, I want to say no wind. And then I want to launch. And it's running the simulation and it found the maximum altitude. So now I'm going to go to plot graph and I'm going to plot the drag force and the coefficient of drag at the same time. I'll make the drag force a green so we can tell them apart. Um, and let's plot it versus time. And plot graph. Okay, so here's my graph. Let's see if you can see it. Um, so the drag force is in newtons, and so um, as it starts out, you can see the drag force building, 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 until it gets to burnout, and then the drag force starts, you know, the rocket's slowing down, so the drag is increasing. And you can see it's a parabolic curve, and that's because drag is proportional to the velocity squared. So you get a nice parabolic right here. Now the, the CD, um, CD is, is, is changing as well. 
Um, but what I wanted to show was you need to compare this drag force versus against another simulation. And the other simulation I would run is if, if there was wind in the simulation. So this time I'm going to, under launch conditions, I'm going to throw in some wind. I'm going to do a, a custom speed of 8 miles an hour. So when low and high wind speed are set to the same number, it's a constant wind blowing across the field. And click launch. Okay, you can see that the altitude was lower because of the wind, so the, the rocket is actually weathercocking into the wind. Um, and you'll see that if I plot the same thing again, plot the graph, you can see the drag coefficient is changing. And that's changing because as the rocket's going up and there's wind, you're getting a change in surface area. And that's why the, this coefficient of drag is kind of oscillating. Um, but then the drag is actually dependent on the coefficient of drag. So it's axial force means there's only drag along the axis. We're, we're, we're actually getting drag on the side of the rocket too. So the question, the answer to the question is, it is using the total drag force. Ah, those are hard questions. <laughs> um, Karen Ma says, a little more complicated than I hoped, but thanks for the info. And we have Joseph Dunning from Alamogordo, New Mexico, saying hello. Hopefully, I got to all the questions. Let me scroll back up. Oh, not me, not me, not Ron, not me says some competition drag race or parachute duration rocket gets more drag by doing shock cord tricks to have the model hang sideways during descent. Can rock sim. Okay, so what he's talking about is um, parachute duration contests. Let me uh, go to this this one angle right here. So in a parachute design or parachute descent contest, you want as much drag on the rocket as possible. Um, so you get more drag when the rocket's coming down horizontal. So when the parachute comes out, you still want the body tube to be coming down horizontal with the parachute somewhere, you know, somewhere up here in the top. Um, because you do have more surface area from the fins and the body tube. So does, how does Roxim account for that? And basically to account for that, you actually have to change the coefficient of drag of the parachute because Roxim always assumes once the parachute opens, it's only the parachute that is affecting the drag coefficient because the parachute is usually so big um, compared to the drag on the rocket that it's, it's overwhelming uh, by a factors of magnitude. So just adjust, tweak the coefficient of drag of your parachute. You just, you know, increase the number just a little bit. You know, how much should you increase it? And this is the same question that Karama asked. How do you find the coefficient of drag of a rocket? And you've got to measure it by measuring acceleration. Um, you can also do it by descent rate. But it's, uh, for, for parachutes, because they're coming down so slow, that would be probably be the easiest way to do it. Find the descent rate and then back out the coefficient of drag. And it's the same newsletter article that I showed you, um, peak of flight number 303, which came out in January of 2012. Um, Ronald McDonald says the earth is flat. <laughs> okay. I think that's, I think that's all the questions that we have time for today because it's now we've been here an hour. <laughs> so 
Um, we will be back next week at the same time, which is 2 p.m. Mountain or 4 p.m. East Coast time. And we're here to answer your questions and try to figure it out. Um, we're getting the same questions over and over again. <laughs> and um, I don't know if it's people expecting a different answer or they're just not here the previous weeks. So come to the previous weeks so I don't have to answer the same questions over and over. But if they are asked, I will try to answer them because um, that's what you're here for. So thank you for coming, everybody. Um, well, we had a lot of people this week. We had 24 concurrent viewers, and we'll probably get a couple hundred more that are watch it um, on YouTube later. So hello to the people that are watching it later. Uh, we wish you were here. Um, it's so cool to, to answer the questions live. My name again was Tim Van Milligan, and I am going to end this stream here in five, four, three, two. One, go out and launch something. <laughs>